everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Sam Adams Lanham. I'm the Community Engagement Librarian here in the Barrington area. Um, that means that I create programming for the benefit of our local nonprofit partners and in conjunction with our local nonprofit partners. So that is my great privilege, therefore, to work with the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area to bring you this forum to help inform you about the candidates for the upcoming elections. A few technical things I want to go over. Um, we are asking everyone on the call to um, please stay muted and keep your video camera turned off. We're recording. Um, it also helps to prevent you know, your, your fellow audience members from losing bandwidth and, and not being able to see and hear properly. So we appreciate that. Um, the recordings will be posted on the library's YouTube channel as well as the League of Women Voters website. Um, if you know folks who were not able to be here and wanted to see this information, you're um, free to share that with them. With that, I am going to ask our audience members to take a brief poll um, on how you heard about this forum today. Um, it is anonymous. You can select more than one answer if more than one applies, um, but it really makes it easier for the um, for the league to be able to get the word out, to know what is the most effective way of communicating this information to the public. And I think, okay, so minus the six of us, I think that is nearly everyone who is voting. So I'm gonna end, oh, I just got one more. I'm gonna end polling and share the results. And it looks like most folks were the League of Women's voters, um, either from a member or through the newsletter and then library newsletter or calendar was second. So thank you all for that. And let me close this. And I will turn things over to my League partner, Kathy Cortez. Good afternoon. And thank you for attending today's candidate forum featuring candidates running for the Barrington Library Board. My name is Kathy Cortez and I'm a candidate forum coordinated for the uh, League of Women Voters of the Palatine area, which serves not only Palatine, but several contiguous communities with whom we share legislative districts. Founded in 1920, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that neither supports opposes nor recommends candidates for office. The League was founded here in Chicago in 1920 in order to help educate and inform new female voters who had just won their right to vote. The League's purpose is to promote responsibility through the informed and active participation of all citizens. Providing this forum enables members of the community to become better informed about the issues facing the community and the candidates running for office. We're pleased to offer this service to you. We'd like to extend our sincerest thanks to Sam Adams, the community engagement librarian from the Barrington Area Library, whose help and technology have really made today's forum possible. Sam's our co-host today, and she'll actually be operating the webinar. During today's presentation, all audience members will be muted. We will not be using chat or raised hands features all questions for the candidates were actually submitted by the audience in advance during their registration or from local nonpartisan community organizations. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's forum, Kate Williams. Kate's been a member of the League of Women Voters for the last eight years. She's a past secretary of the League of Women Voters of Illinois and currently serves as president of the McHenry County League. Educating voters is part of what Kate does every day. Having been trained as a moderator by the Illinois League of Women Voters, she has moderated many forums, and so we're very fortunate that she's able to be with us this afternoon. Kate? Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate it. It's always an honor to, to join in. Um, one quick note. You may see the three of us, the timer and Kathy and myself, maybe just periodically looking over uh, we've exchanged cell phone numbers. It's a, a fact of life in case someone loses connectivity 
or in case we're we're noticing some someone freezing on the screen. So we're not calling lifelines or anything like that. So uh, so that's why you might see that. So uh, let me take a couple of minutes to explain the format and the rules of this forum. All the candidates were contacted by mail, email, and even a phone call, and they've agreed to abide by the rules provided by the League of Women Voters. And those rules are, candidates have drawn numbers to determine speaking orders. The moderator will then rotate through that order during the forum for the questions. Each candidate will start out with an opening statement of two minutes. And then, and we do have one candidate that was not able to be with us. And uh, Kathy Cortez will read that statement after the three uh, will give their opening statements. They then will have one minute to answer each question. And I'll always repeat the question if needed. And if the candidates feel they need a rebuttal, they may request it. And each candidate has two rebuttals and there are a maximum of 30 seconds a piece and our timer will, will give those signals. And uh, then at the end, we'll have a one minute closing statement. Timer, you've already explained it, but let's make sure the audience knows what they'll be seeing. Could you hold up your paddles? Sure, thank you. Good each afternoon. candidate, go ahead and explain your timing process. So for, op for opening, uh, the two minute opening, you'll, the candidates will see a one minute paddle. And then there are further paddles for 30 seconds and 15 seconds. And this could be an important one. It's a, the stop sign. Um, but to go, please go ahead when you see this uh, to finish, finish your sentence and finish your thought. Thank you. Great, thank you. Today's forum is being recorded for the League of Women Voters used in educating the public. A video of this forum will be available early next week on the League of Women Voters of Palatine's website and the Barrington Area Library. And the candidates have agreed to this. No voice, image, or duplication of the forum can be used by the candidate's represent representative or in any campaign literature. The League of Women Voters does claim the copyright and ownership of all these recordings and transcripts produced from this event and re 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 excuse me, reserves the right to publish this forum. And to look at the uh, forum, you'll go to the Palatine website. Today, we're greeting candidates for the Barrington Library Board. We have four candidates vying for two seats. Our candidates appearing with us today are Ann Ordway, Jennifer Lucas, Josie Kroll, and Denise Tenure. So candidates, let's go ahead and get started. I want to thank you for being here. We'll get started, Ann. Two-minute statement, opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Ann Ordway. And I wanna thank everyone for taking the time to listen in today. It means you care about the library. My favorite card to me and my wallet is my library card. My family and I are using the library and its resources every day. When the library closed down in March due to COVID, I was understanding. When it closed down again in November, I was confused. Other libraries stayed open for browsing like Schomburg and Fox River Groves. And on March 1st, the Barrington Library reopened again, but you can't use a study room. Let your kids play in the children's area, get a drink of water, and the hours of operation are limited. I can't find a place to sit down and read a book. No plan is in place as to when a full reopening will happen. Meanwhile, people in our community have been isolated and alone. Time to have a plan to get them back into our beautiful library safely and responsibly. Someone once said, bad libraries build collections, good libraries build services, and great libraries build communities. Our library is an anchor in the Barrington community. My running mate Josie can talk more about finances, but the library is sitting on over 9 million in cash and they keep asking for more money with the tax levies. If elected for library board trustee, along with Josie and Mark, we will reopen the library fully, 
safely restore fiscal responsibility and reduce the tax levies. JK Rowling, a favorite author in our household said, when in doubt, go to the library. Let's all go back to the library. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. Hi, right, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for listening today. My name is Jennifer Lucas. And in my 20 years in the Barrington community, I've been in, had leadership roles on many organizations, including the Barrington Area Conservation Trust, the Barrington Breakfast Rotary, Fox Point Homeowners Association, the DAR, and Impact 100 Chicago. I even started an organization called Go Green Barrington. Joining the library board last summer gave me the chance to expand on my desire to serve people of all ages, all races, and all economic spectrums. My background as an attorney with Winston and Strawn uh, and my experience with these organizations allows me to contribute to the library in multiple ways. I have experience with budgets, personnel issues, strategic plans. I have experienced commu uh, advertising community programs and know the issues that organizations face. On a personal level, I've benefited from a broad range of the library services from children's programs to nonprofit services to meeting rooms and more. And I know how vital those programs are and I know how important it is that we continue the existing sound financial planning for the future. Uh, one of my concerns in the coming years is that we continue to make people aware of the library services so that they can reach out to the library. The library now is uh, uh, one of the areas of support in our community. A person seeking jobs can find job services. A parent needing a tutor can reach out for a tutor. So I'm committed to helping more people reach out to the hand that the library offers. As to upcoming financial issues, my opponents have actually stated information that is completely untrue. The library is not sitting on a $9 million rainy day fund. I hope to have the chance to tell you more about that. Thank you, Jennifer. Josie. Hi I'd, like to, hi, I'd like to thank the League of Women voters, voters for hosting this forum and the audience for taking their time to hear what we have to say. My name is Josie Krall. My husband and I grew up in Barrington and reside in Barrington Hills with our three school-aged children, Courtney, William, and Evelyn. I'm running for the Library Board of Trustees along with Ann Ordway and Mark Stenberg for three reasons primarily. To restore financial responsibility, reduce the tax levy, and reopen the library fully and safely. I discovered that over the past number of years, the library has dramatically increased their cash holdings while continuing to increase the property tax levy. The levy has been raised every year since 2014, and um, now $9.4 million sits on their balance sheet. In addition, the Barrington Area Library has been closed while other libraries, including Dundee and Wheaton, were open. They have recently opened March 1st, but I'm referring to prior to that. The online option is not good enough. Kids have suffered from Zoom overload and not all patrons have access to computers and the internet. Seniors have been isolated. The current board is putting residents at a disadvantage by unduly limited, limiting access to the resources they've paid for and need. Our village library boards have more clearly seen the essential nature of services they provide and made sure they were fully available where ours has not. On um, all my mother's group chats that I'm on, uh, they're talking about getting the kids back to school full time. Kids are struggling now, they're suffering. They would have loved to have the resource of the library during all this time. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll have Kathy Cortez read a two minute statement from the candidate that was not able to be here. Kathy. Thanks, Kate. And one uh, additional thing that I'll mention is that uh, Josie made mention of Mark who um, uh, is running with them. Uh, Mark is, was recently appointed to a part-time position and he is running uncontested. And as a result, Mark was not invited to this session because he's obviously running uh, uncontested. The other candidate that cannot be with us today is Denise Tenure. And she has asked me to say thank you uh, to the League of Women Voters and also just indicate that she had a prior commitment that prevented her from, uh, from being here. Uh, 
this, uh, then I'm, I'm going to just read uh, Denise's statement. My name is Denise Tenure. I'm asking your support as I run for re-election to the Barrington Area Library Board of Trustees. I'm a longtime resident of Barrington and the proud owner, educator, and founder of Learning Trek Academy. Learning Trek Academy is a Barrington-based reading readiness and early literacy program focusing on children ages three and older. Giving back to my community has always been important to me. I consider myself a lifelong volunteer. As a 13-year-old, I began candy striping at my local hospital, went on to work as a hospice volunteer, and also worked as a domestic violence crisis hotline worker. I have volunteered at my local church, been on the board, of the local chapter of the National Association for the Education of Young Children, and was also a proud member of the Barrington Junior Women's Club. I bring you experience. I am proud to have served on the board of trustees of the Barrington Library for six years. I have served as a member at large, board secretary, served on various committees such as public policy, long range planning, and budget finance and levy. I currently hold the position of treasurer. This is a unique time for our library and, uh, and community during the COVID-19 crisis. I'm most proud of our board and our library's response to the disruptions caused by the pandem pandemic. Having to stay at home and lessen social activities has caused many to feel isolated. We made it a priority to reach out to our patrons and make them aware of our services that they can utilize while remaining safe at home. Our staff has stepped up to address this novel situation by providing safe access to our building and services for both our patrons and staff. I'm running for re-election for the library board because I want to continue my commitment to our community. Ensuring high quality cutting edge materials and programs in state of the art buildings for our patrons is top of the list. A focus on fiscal responsibility is something I hold foremost in my board responsibilities. As an educator of young children, I've always recognized the importance of the library. The library is a magical place for young children to discover the joy of reading. And as a teacher, I always encourage my students to utilize the resources that our wonderful library offers. It's my goal to keep our library a vital and welcoming place for our children. Moving forward, I'm motivated to explore new opportunities and foster uh, to foster and extend the library's goodwill through seeking out relationships in our community. I want to continue to ensure that our library remains a vital and integral part of the community, one that partners with our community to address the needs of our patrons. I want our library to continue to be a vibrant community meeting place where everyone feels welcome, seen, and heard. I ask for your vote and your support. Thank you, Kathy. I also want to mention there were over 35 questions submitted for this uh, forum, and that's a great, great testament to the interest that your community has. And so let's get started with those questions. Question number one, what's the biggest challenge facing the library right now? And we'll start with Jennifer. One minute, biggest challenge facing the library. Uh, one of the biggest challenges right now is misinformation. The library's financial dealings are completely transparent and ethical. The library posts all its financial documents on its website. The library does not have a $9 million rainy day fund. The actual amount of $9 million that you see on financial statements is the operating funds of the library. From that amount, uh, salaries are paid, expenses are paid, heat is paid. Uh, the library is not accumulating $9 million or sitting on $9 million from year to year. The actual special reserves of the library are closer to $2 million. And that's because the library had a massive study done of all the repairs needed between now and 2039. Rather than being foolhardy to keep that reasonable amount of savings, it's actually a wise move so that we don't let the library fall into disrepair and have to force the taxpayers of the future to pass a referendum. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, Josie, what's um, the biggest challenge facing the library? Well, the biggest challenge facing the library is first of all, opening it up. They need to come up with the plan. On the last board meeting, there was no real pushback, no real dialogue, no real plan of how they're gonna open. And I thought that was, 
you know, quite alarming. Um, in terms of what, um, what Jennifer just said, I'd like to say that that isn't true. The, the operating budget is $6.5 million. And a library is a not is a not-for-profit business. It's a government entity. It's not supposed to have retained earnings like a business. It's supposed to raise taxes that it expects to expend over the next fiscal year. Um, it's just a, a big budget there. If you know, if you want, if you have plans for the future, the taxpayer has a right to know what they are. You can't just hoard cash. Thank you. Anne, same question, one minute. Yeah, I, as far as what I think some of the biggest challenges for the library right now, I mean, I really do think it's a full reopening. I'd like to see the children back in there and using the equipment. I mean, it's just such a wonderful library and we have such a wonderful space. We gotta be back in there um, fully. I mean, I wanna go sit and read a book. And um, as far as the finances go, Jennifer, are you, are you saying you have money for 20, all the way up to 2039? Are we, we sitting on 18 years of cash at the library right now? I, I, I'm confused. I am very confused by what the library is doing. I, I, I don't think there is a, enough transparency going on there. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. This question appeared in various forms three different times. So I think it's an important I'm, one. I'm sorry, Kate. I'm going to Sam, it's I'm so gonna it's interrupt you like just a Jen moment. Sure. Jennifer raised her hand, I believe, for a rebuttal. That's okay. We can go on. I'll use it later. All right. Thank you. Okay. I didn't catch that. I'm sorry. The issue centers around, do you have any thoughts or a position on the underpass construction on Route 14? And um, Josie, we'll start with you. Thank you for the question. Um, I have spoken to a lot of... Um, people who live in the village, people connected with the village. And basically it's sort of water under the bridge. They are in phase two now that the original design has been rejected by the library. That all happened, everybody knows it. Now they have the new plan and um, that's where they are. It's phase two, we can't go back and, um, and you know hash that out again. They have to continue to move forward with this new plan that they have. All right, thank you. Anne, same question. Positions or thoughts on the cons underpass construction on Route 14? Well, I, the previous board voted on it and now we're in phase two. There's not much that can be done. I don't really have any thoughts or, I mean, it's done. I mean, it's it's into phase two and, and the parking lot is set the way it is and the roads are set the way it is. and. Um, I don't know what else to say on that one. Okay, good. All right, Jennifer. Uh, yeah, I mean, I repeat what we've said is the uh, the village came up with a new design that allowed it to go forward with the underpass without asking the library to give up or sell land or disrupt services. Uh, I reviewed the public library district acts that restricted the library's uh, actions at the time and the thorough investigation they did uh, but luckily, there's a new design and we're moving forward and I expect uh, things to go uh, in a spirit of cooperation as the village works through that new design. All right, good. Question number three was submitted through the library's uh, website. How will the library change to, the, to be current with the new digital age? What plans do you have to now? Let's just stay because that's a two-part question. How will the library change to be current with the digital age? And Anne, we'll start with you. Well, I think that's a really good question. I think it's a really good question for the library staff. I think as a board member, we would help direct the staff in the way that maybe consumers and users want to use it, but I, I do think that's directly, I think the library, frankly, has done an excellent job on giving um, online resources for people. I, I think that, you know, I even heard in the last board meeting that they're, you know, they're aggressively going for online stuff. And I think in that area, I don't have 
I, I do. I really believe that the library is doing a good job. And as a board member, we just continue to make that better. Good, good. Jennifer? Yeah, so the question is how they can come up with the digital age. And of course, I feel like they've already been doing an excellent job with that. 30,000 people attended their programs during 2020, and much of that was virtual, uh, as well as they had uh, uh, 200,000 things checked out digitally. Obviously, um, this staff is excellent and continues to be cutting ed edge with different programs. They are trying to get children's programs to be back in person. That's the priority. And because of the wonderful grounds around the library, they're gonna be able to do some of that outside. But I think in the continuing digital age, some adult programs did very well uh, on virtual format. And so maybe we'll continue a little bit of that, but uh, the staff is excellent and they're both frugal and creative and I'm sure they will deal well with any upcoming digital age questions. All right, and Josie? Yes, well, I concur with both of uh, the ladies in the sense that digital is not going away. Um, but in my opinion, the priority is always in person. You know, I was, I was looking back at some photos of my children in the library and they were in the, um, the Lego area and the light area and the slide and the friends. And this is where we develop friendships and community and, you know, as great as digital is and it's here to stay and that's wonderful and that's a resource for some, it is not the best resource for everyone. Um, I know people like my mother, she doesn't wanna go anywhere near it. Um, she wants to go in there, she wants to browse, she wants to look at books. I know my kids, they want the social in, you know, environment that the library provides. Good, thank you. All right, what has the library done, any special programming to address the mental health issues the community's facing during this isolation? And Jennifer, we'll start with you. Yes, the library has partnered well with groups like Be Strong and offered programs dealing with mental health, um, as well as just the services, the wide range of services that they have offered during the pandemic. Uh, whether or not you wish it could be in person to keep people safe, they kept things uh, at a distance, but people literally wrote, you kept me sane. Uh, between the parking lot pickups and the borrow by mail and the many programs that they offered, of course, we would prefer in person, um, but I think they did a great service to people mentally by providing all those programs. But on an ongoing basis, they do work with the existing groups in the community to provide programming uh, dealing with mental health. Good, good. Josie? Yes, I think not enough has been done. Um, I think, like I said, I'm on chats with mothers, community members all day long. And I know firsthand what's going on because I, I have kids in the, the district. I know what this has done to children. And you know, it's funny because while everybody's at, at home, um, e-learning, I'm, you know, have a pod in my house, you know, doing whatever I can to have my children socialize. Uh, not everyone, fortunately, unfortunately, didn't get, you know, to, to go to pods or didn't have that resource. The library conference rooms would have been a really nice outlet, a place for these kids to go, um, for mothers to see another human being. I mean, I think that the mental health issue is one of the biggest concerns um, in our community. And I think there could have been a lot more programming, both in person and, you know, um, virtually. All right, thank you. Anne? Uh, I like the question. I. I'm not as versed in it as I probably should be. Um, I, I'll just speak on a personal level from a mental health aspect. Zoom calls are great, but they're not like meeting in person. And I think the library has done an excellent job on helping community groups get on Zoom calls. I just like to, again, see more in person. And I would say having a high schooler at home who was basically by herself, you know, taking all these classes online, it would have been nice for her maybe just to get to a study room once in a while to go sit in there and study for a little while, just get a little outside of the house a little bit. And, uh, and I think that helps people's mental health. 
All right, good, good. All right, the next one. Online reviews of the library indicate the children's section placement on an, the open main floor make the library too loud and too disruptive. What would you do about that issue? So it sounds like the children's area, people are saying too loud, too disruptive. So Josie, we'll start with you. Well, you're t first of all, you're talking to somebody with three of the loud, disruptive children, I'm sure. So um, in that sense, you know, I guess I take it from a different perspective. However, we have to be respectful to all the patrons. So if that is the case, then maybe we consider, I, had, I hadn't thought about this issue, so it is a good question. Maybe we consider um, hours or, you know, in those back rooms where the kids do the arts and craft projects, maybe we utilize those more. You know, uh, one thing I have noticed is all the computers for the children are out in the middle of the room, which I don't like anyhow, because kids are there to read books and I know my kids gravitate towards the computers because I don't let them do that here at home. Um, I would like for those to be in the back and maybe, you know, we could have some of the play area in the back room. I think that is that is something that can absolutely happen and, and be, you know, um, improved. All right. Thank you. And uh, I'm old enough to remember when the library for the children was upstairs. That's where I used to take my kids to read books. So I don't know um, why the library moved the children's section downstairs. I, I definitely think that's something to consider. Um, and we definitely take feedback from, from uh, parents and find out why. And I think that's something we can talk about as board members, um, but great question. Thank you. Great. Jennifer, question. And I wasn't on the board when the decision was made to move the children's department to the lower level. Uh, but I, I agree with Josie that maybe there's a way to use some doors. I understand they'd have to be fire doors, but maybe some some modifications that can be made to lessen the sound that bothers other patrons. Um, but I have to overall say that uh, some of the issues we've been discussing are not the children's department, but some issues have been are for the past. Um, the study rooms, one of the reasons that the library didn't open the study rooms was because the school district asked the library to hold back. We didn't want an outbreak of COVID caused by the library when we were trying to get the schools open. So the, because the study rooms are confined areas uh, where the air doesn't circulate, they've been, um, the library is specially looking into that to see how they can get them open. Um, but again, we're moving forward. Um, and a lot of the issues that we've been discussing are about during COVID. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. A question came in and they used a, an acronym, SWAN, S-W-A-N, is a group of 100 libraries throughout the Chicago area that share resources. And do you think that the Barrington Area Library should join that network? And we'll start with Anne. And maybe it's appropriate. Uh, I'm sorry, Sam, what? Sam, could you uh, uh, help us with what the, the acronym SWAN stands for? Sure. So there are several different, um, not interlibrary, but uh, systems across the state that um, serve libraries. So there's, there's two levels of these things. Sorry, let me turn my camera on a moment because I am talking with my hands and you can't see me. Um, so um, there are two levels of these things. There's one that um, shares resources on kind of a macro level. Um, and we are part of the rails reaching across Illinois library system. I believe SWAN is um, similar to that. The other are, for example, I live in West Dundee. The uh, Fox River Valley Public Library District is part of a consortium with some local libraries where, for example, ebooks are shared um, amongst, amongst the libraries. There's the North, North Suburban Digital Consortium purchases all the ebooks that one can obtain through um, Libby, for example. 
And so when I put myself on a list to get an ebook, it's a list that's composed of all the member libraries of people who are waiting okay. for that. So ladies, let me know if that gives you enough information to be able to answer the question. Sam, I was kind of hoping you would answer that question. <laughs> you know something, I think candidates, if it's all right with you, I think I'm gonna step back from that question. It sounds like the acronym and the action that uh, it's more of a technical or not technical, but more of a, a relationship that um, may not be the, the best kind of question for candidates. So if that's okay with everybody, we'll step back from that question. Good. Um, all right. We're going to start now with Anne again. And um, since you decided to run for election, what have you done to learn more about the library and familiarize yourself with the operations and the finances? That's a, that's a great question. I have spent um, lots of time talking to residents. I have called and talked to the president of the board, Don Miner, and had a nice conversation with him. I talked to a past board member. I um, looked over all the finances. I, that's not my specialty is to read graphs and finances. I don't I don't have my MBA. And um, Mark Stenberg's been really helping us try and understand that. He, he's, he's really well versed in that. Um, but I, I do understand like building maintenance because I'm in real estate and I do a lot of commercial real estate and I handle the HOAs. So I'm good at the building part of it. Um, and I'm good at the user experience because I use the library every day. All right, good, thank you. Jennifer? Can you repeat the question? What have you done during your campaign to learn more about the library and the finances, the operations? First of all, I wanna say that when I was concerned about issues with the village of Barrington or with the school board district, I attended many board meetings. The challengers to the library board have attended one library board meeting and asked no questions. They haven't met with the executive director. So there's questions that are easier to understand when you have a meeting with the current staff. What have I done to learn more is ask questions at board meetings, is to ask questions of the library staff uh, and uh, to get an understanding of the library taxation process, which is complicated. The library does not set a rate of taxation. It actually asks for a dollar amount from the counties each year, and it can't increase that dollar amount more than the property tax extension law limit. It stays well below that limit and balances it against the rising costs of healthcare, workers comp, and more. All right, thank you. All right, Josie, same question. What have you done to familiarize yourself uh, during your campaign about the library's finances, operations? Well, I've done a lot actually, and I thank you very much for asking that question. I actually did speak to the director for a very long time. I had a lengthy conversation, as did Anne, with Jesse, the, the prior director. Um, I FOIA all kinds of information. I actually went through, personally, went through years and years and years of their, their financials and looked at all of it and looked at all of the tax levies and looked at the balance sheet and looked at how they were spending. I've been on that website. I have been inside. Well, I, I use the library, so I am inside often, but um, keeping an eye on it all, seeing how they're navigating during you know, the pandemic, seeing what, what safety measures they have taken. I think I've done a lot of research. It's um, something I'm known for. It's something I'm good at. and. Um, I'm always trying to find ways to learn. I don't always say I have the answers, but I'm, I'm talking to people and I'm learning. I've also spoken to a lot of people in the community, really, because they are the people who use the library. And All I- All right, thank you. Thanks. All right, good. Number seven question. How would you improve community feedback? And Jennifer, we'll start with you. One of my biggest concern is that uh, we continue to reach out to the people in the community who may not be aware of the library services. Uh, this is one of the first things I asked the new executive director. I know they're using metrics and working with District 220, 
to try to find out how they can uh, reach more people in the community. Um, and I even volunteered and I said, I'd be happy to go to community meals and different things like that to reach more people in the community. Uh, and obviously not everyone can respond to uh, online programs for giving it or websites and Facebook and things like that to give their feedback. I know the staff welcomes feedback in person and responds uh, to those comments. So um, I'd have to first go to the staff to ask how they'd like to receive feedback, but definitely those are things that are a high concern with me is reaching more people in the community. Good, Josie, you're next. How would you improve community feedback? Well, working with the community and reaching the community is critical for the library. And I would absolutely work closely with the, the Garlands, BACOA, the school districts, whomever. Um, I think sort of the best way is by interviewing patrons and people who, who don't use the library very often and find out why. What are their needs? What is it that they want? Um, but, you know, again, I, I agree with, with Jennifer in the sense that I would talk to the staff as well. You know, we just, the library has so much to offer. It is an amazing, you know, institution. And I think sometimes people don't even realize what's there. So that, that message needs to get out. And I would make sure that I, I worked on that. All right, good. And you'll answer that question. How would you improve community feedback? Well, I think one of the best ways to improve community feedback is like, person to person relationship. When you get to go into the library and ask some questions or even call up the library and ask some questions. And I, I would argue that even sometimes, trust me, I love the library, but calling, just calling on the phone to talk to someone in, the, in person, you gotta go through a bunch of like buttons. And it's sometimes it's just nice to call and have someone to talk to um, on the first answer. And I, I think that's probably number one for me. It would be great to have call the library and just have someone on the phone. All right, good, good. Next question. Would you support the establishment of a nonprofit foundation to support the library, similar to Barrington 220 Foundation? So Josie, we'll start with you. Can you repeat the question? Certainly. Would you support the establishment of a nonprofit foundation to help support the library similar to the Barrington 220 Foundation? Well, the Barrington 220 Foundation has done amazing work for the schools. Um, so, wow. Yeah, I mean, I would love to hear the pitch. I would love to hear what they could have to offer. Um, you know, it's hard to just say yes when we don't know what it is we're talking about, but anything, one thing I can tell you about me is I like to work in collaboration with others and, you know, other entities too, if it's a mutual win-win. It has to be beneficial for the library and most importantly, the people. All right, Anne, would you support the establishment of a nonprofit foundation to help support the library similar to the Barrington 220 Foundation? I'm in agreement with Josie on how wonderful the Barrington 220 Foundation is. I really enjoy the speakers that they bring in and I think they got the media equipment for the high school. Um, again, I don't know enough. I don't know enough about what that foundation would look like and I'd certainly want to know more. I, I'd almost want to ask that person who asked the question a follow-up question just a little bit more. but I guess that's my answer for now. Great, Jennifer. Uh, at first, the idea is very exciting, just like Josie said. I would love to have an organization that was devoted to giving volunteers for library special events and special fundraising. But then my voice of reason at the moment says, let's push that off a couple years. The Barrington area already has more nonprofits than any other community. The fundraising is struggling during this time of COVID. Uh, so I would actually say, let's partner with our existing organizations right now. If we need volunteers, let's call up the Barrington Junior Women's Club, the Barrington Breakfast Rotary, the Lions Club, and ask them for volunteers, and even maybe link with them on some fundraising projects like we did with the Barrington Breakfast Rotary for the 
native teaching garden in the library grounds uh, and maybe use our existing relationships, which I could help with in the immediate years. Um, but I love the idea of a foundation somewhere down the line. Good. Well, I wanna be fair to the library patrons that submitted this and there were uh, at least four people in some form or another asked this question. Do you know why the tax levy for the library was raised every year since 2014 while accumulating cash on the balance sheet of 9.2 million? So, Anne, we're gonna start with you. I, I don't know why the, the levy was raised and we're in, or accumulating cash. If, if it's true that we've got 18, I, I don't, when Jennifer said we have cash on the, on the balance sheet to 2039, I wonder why we got to trust our residents to give us the money, to give the library the money when they need it and not take the money from the residents until it's needed. That would be my answer to that question. Thank you. Jennifer. Um, first to clarify, I'm not saying that we're sitting on money until 2039. I just said that it is wise that we have a certain amount of savings because we have a, a, a study done of all the repairs that are needed between now and 2039. Some of that savings actually went down last year as we made repairs on the parking lot and canopy. I'm just saying it's a wise move to have some savings so that we don't have to ask for a referendum for a falling down building in the future. Um, again, the tax levy is done because the library sets a particular dollar amount that it asks for the from the counties and it can't increase that amount more than the property tax extension law limit. It stays well below that limit and balances it against rising costs of healthcare workers comp and more. It does not accumulate $9 million or sit on $9 million. It has a special reserve of $2 million right now, and that's used continually on these repairs. All right. Thank you. Josie? I think that's a question for Denise, who is in here, because she is both on the levy committee and the treasurer. And I think it's a great question that needs to be answered. But the library can't just levy money that it isn't budgeted for. You're not supposed to tax people for something anticipating expenses that might never be spent. Um, if And going to Jennifer's point, that's what referendums are for. If, if, if a serious large need does arise, um, that's what bonding and credit ratings are for. It's not stash away just in case. All right, good. I think we'll go ahead. It's about four, four. Jennifer. I have my hand raised. Please, you have a 30 second rebuttal. Right, and so I just wanna say that when they levy, that is for the existing year. Uh, it's not to levy to try to make a big stockpile. They levy to pay the existing expenses. They have managed to save some because they have all these repairs coming but they're not trying to levy to create some huge stockpile. They do not keep a stockpile of $9 million. They levy year to year and they keep it restrained by the property tax extension law limit. All right, thank you. Wanna check my screen to make sure there's no rebuttals. <laughs> it's about 448. So we'll ask one more question and then we'll move to closing statements. Would you support the library putting its financial statements online at least quarterly? Posting financial statements quarterly. So we'll start with Jennifer. I don't really understand because they post them immediately like within one month. So you don't even have to wait for a quarter. All the audits and financial statements are completely transparent on the website. Um, and, and you don't even have to wait for a quarterly to see those. Um, in addition, the library staff's always willing to talk to people uh, about the budgeting process. And a taxing entity is different than, all the, than a regular business or a nonprofit. And so there are things to learn, but uh, the library is very transparent and has sound long-term planning. 
Good, thank you. That's an important way to educate the community. So Josie, same question. Well, I'm going to use your words. It's an important way to educate the community. Absolutely. We have to be transparent. Um, the library is, is uh, their financials are relevant to everybody. Everybody should have access to them. And they need to be put up immediately, transparent, understandable. And yes, so I'm completely in favor of having them up as soon as they're available monthly. All right. Thank you. And so I do know that the, the finances are up online. You can, you can read them online. I would say though, it would be nice if it was a little bit easier to get on a board meeting. Um, it's easy to get on if you understand it, but it'd be nice if more people in the community could listen in on the board meetings and it's just a very simple something at the top of the board page that would explain how to just click on the right button. That would be helpful because it took me about a while to find out how to get on a board meeting. All right, good, good. I think we'll now move into closing statements. And um, Jennifer, we'll start with you. All right, thank you for taking the time to listen today. I just wanna repeat that the library finances are completely responsible and transparent. As the Daily Herald said, the library is well run both in finances and in programming. The library stays well below the legal limits on taxation and provides conservative sound financial planning for the future in the face of rising healthcare, minimum wage laws, workers' compensation. The library provides excellent programming that helps our economy and our education system. And that education system is what draws people to buy homes here. So I am committed to spending all my skills and energy to continue those excellent programs not only for us, but for the next generation. I encourage people to look at my website and my Facebook page to see the many endorsements I have from business owners, community leaders, and teachers, and to vote for Jennifer Lucas and Denise Tenure on April 6th. Thank you. Josie, closing statement. Well, thank you very much for hosting this forum. Um, I do think it's surprising that one of my opponents who is the current treasurer and on the finance committee isn't here to explain why the levy was raised every year since at least 2014 and what cash is piled up on their balance sheet. It has, it's a fact. I've looked through all of it. I've FOIA'd it. I know what I'm talking about. I am sure the taxpayers would like to know also. They are clearly, they are not taking the financial responsibility seriously enough. I pledge to start reducing the tax levy to save taxpayers their hard earned money. I will do this not only by reducing fund balances, but also by finding ways to save money. There's more to be found uh, in, in those funds. The library serves 44,000 residents. It has a budget of $6,500,000. The excess cash they could theoretically give back $214 to each man, woman, and child in the district. That's over $850 for a family of four. I bet right. a lot Thank of taxpayers you. would love to Thank you. Uh, see their money back in their Thanks, pocket. Thanks, Josie. Thank you. Thank you. And closing right. statement. Well, thanks everyone for listening in. Um, there are a lot of options for people who don't wanna come into the library, like parking lot pickup, virtual classes, and online books. However, let's not lose the library as a gathering space. It's the lifeblood of a great community. And we have a very good library, but good is the enemy of great. The library needs to trust our community with a safe, responsible, full reopening. And the taxpayers and voters need to trust the library to have fiscally responsible management. I wanna ensure that our voters and taxpayers are not overtaxed and underserved, but rather they feel undertaxed and overserved. Thank you. And please go out and vote on April 6th for Ann Ordway and Josie Kroll. And Great. check our website at suburbanactionpath.com. All right. Thank you, candidates. I really appreciate it. And thank you for allowing us to uh, step away from that one question. It was an acronym and, and a little harder to, to explain. So thank you. Thank you. Kathy, I'll let you go ahead and uh, bring the forum to a close. 
to uh, all the candidates. As we bring our forum to a close, I wanna thank the candidates again for their uh, participation here. We'd like to encourage all of our candidates to recycle any campaign signs they have. Members of the public can do so. And uh, if you go out to the League of Women Voter Palatine area website, there's some information on how to do that. Also, any uh, anybody who signed up for today's uh, uh, forum, if you're not registered, you can also find registration information on the League of Women Voters uh, website. And on behalf of the League and the Barrington Area Library, thanks to everyone for coming. Don't forget that early voting begins on uh, March 22nd now, and there's plenty of election information available on our site. Uh, please participate in our democracy by casting your ballot. Your vote is your voice. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Thank you very much.